Welcome to a Healing Peace Podcast. My name is Kimir Baker. I am an overcomer, writer, speaker, and God enthusiast. I am fueled by helping women achieve their emotional healing so that they can live the abundant life God has for them. In this podcast series, we provide faith-based inspiration to men from emotional hurt, along with tools and tips for emotional wellness. In your journey, as you apply these tools and tips, you will begin to live the transformed life that you always desire. In fact, you will possess a new you. Welcome back, a Healing Peace audience. I am so excited to what we have for you today. I have a friend who is joining us, and we're just going to have a good time just talking and talking about God and how he loves us and how he heals us and how he wants us to have and make decisions that glorify him. But more importantly, that in our moments of disappointments and pain that he's with us. So, Patty, thank you for joining the show. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for including me. Oh, yeah, always. And since people don't know you, can you give us a little background about yourself? Okay, let's see. Where do I begin? I'm 57. I live in Dallas, Texas. My husband and I work with a a fairly large church there, and we have two grown sons. One is about to turn 30, and the youngest is 28. And we've been in the ministry a long time, so... Yes. And I'm pretty sure that you've grown a lot and seen a lot during your time in the ministry. Oh, yeah. God has taught me so much. I think as a leader in God's kingdom, really anybody who's a Christian, the best thing we can do for people around us is to keep growing and changing and being open to whatever God's trying to do in our lives. Yeah. And I know that as I've gotten to know you more, one of the things that has stood out for me and what you just expressed is your level of humility. I've been blown away by your thoughtfulness and your care for people around you. And I'm like, because I know sometimes when I'm around a whole bunch of people, I get frustrated. I'm like, I ain't dealing with you. But I've never seen you respond in that manner. So I commend you for that. And it's definitely been an example for me. Oh, thanks, Kimir. You're you're being very kind. There are definitely times I feel it. I mean, I'm an introvert at heart. And there are times that I, I would like to just go curl up in a dark hole somewhere. It's just kind of how I'm wired. Right. But I feel like God could not have put me in a better place. I love the people that I'm surrounded by. There's a scripture that talks about my boundaries have fallen in pleasant places. And that's what I feel like God has done for me. Wow. And honestly, we could talk about that for a good minute. <laughs> Because as you said, I'm like, oh, I got about 50 more questions. I can ask about that one. But I'm going to keep us on task. And yeah, but it's good to hear that. I think that's the other thing that I appreciate about you guys is that you're viable and you're honest and you're real. And I think so many times we don't get that because we want to look perfect and we want to make sure that we're leading people correctly. and, And in the process of leading in that way, we lose sight that we're human. Yeah. And that yeah, we have our own life. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so here's another good question. In 2019, what was an aha moment for you? Something that you learned in your journey with God and he brought it to you and you're like, okay, <laughs> I'm listening. It's hard to know where to begin. 2019 was the hardest year of my life. And I can launch into that whenever you want me to about why. But God taught me so much about just submitting to Him and not Mm -hmm. being fearful. And Mm -hmm. that no matter what happens, God is going to get me through it. And I don't need to be fearful. And I had no idea how many fears I had until I started working through it. But probably one of the aha moments was learning I just cannot allow myself mentally to think, well, what if about anything? I realized I'd quit what ifing in the really big areas, like what if somebody dies or something like that. But even in smaller areas, like can I do this when I'm nervous about something that I cannot be what ifing? 
that just messes me up and it's not trusting God. Yeah. And I definitely appreciate you sharing that because we've done a couple of podcasts. Well, one in particular about overcoming fears and working through those things so that they're not keeping us from living our lives. And I know as you state that as well, I feel like that was a portion of my 2019 uh-huh. where I had all these fears and not realizing, like sometimes they can be hidden. And the hidden things of my heart, like God exposed and he was like, are you going to trust me? And I learned that during that season, when I was so consumed with fears that I stopped living my life. And then those things that God wanted me to do, I couldn't because I was afraid of the outcome. Yeah. 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 And someone really challenged me to see as well that my fears can become idols where I'm so consumed with them versus what God wants in my life. Yeah. My dream versus God's will. Yeah. Yeah. And as I continue in my journey, I will always have to come back and wrestle through that surrender as you talked about and not allowing those fears and seeing that God works no matter what. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And since you brought that up, Because people who are listening, one of the main reasons why I wanted Patty to join our show is that in 2019, she did have a lot on her plate. And I wanted her to give us an opportunity to share what she learned in that journey. So can you give us a little bit more background information of why 2019 was your toughest year yet? Yeah, I've gotten to the point where I love sharing about it because I think it gives glory to God more than anything. What happened was about four years ago, we knew our youngest son had walked away from God. He wasn't doing well. He was in college and he wasn't living with us. And we knew he wasn't doing great, but we didn't realize just how bad until one of his friends called us. And actually it was while our son was on an airplane coming to visit us. We were having a family vacation together in Colorado. And This friend of his called actually my other son and told us that our younger son was using heroin. Mm -hmm. And I never in a million years thought I would have a child who used heroin that struggled to that degree. And I know that was naive on my part, but we had raised our children in the church. We had family devotionals. We took vacations together. We had dinner together pretty much every night all of that kind of stuff. My husband would read the Bible with them every morning before school, all these things. And you just think if you just put the right things in your kid, it's like you're going to inoculate your kids against sin. And it just doesn't work that way. Right. And, oh, I had so much trouble wrapping my brain around that. So when he got there, of course, we had a family intervention. We talked him into going into rehab and all that. So within days we had him in rehab and We thought, okay, maybe this will be the end of it. But again, that was naive on my part. An opiate addiction is just one of the hardest things for people to overcome. Mm -hmm. And how it began was during college, my son played rugby. And I think if certain people, they're wired to respond to opiates, I think it's almost like they can take it once and something switches over. They just love it. Hmm. And it never occurred to me that my son would love him the way he did, but he had rugby injuries and they gave him opiates for that. And he loved the opiates and he got addicted. Hmm. And what eventually happened, it got so expensive. A friend told him that, oh, you can take heroin and be high. It's for $10 for several days. (sighs) And he got started on heroin. And he thinks now maybe he had surgery his senior year of high school and they put him on opiates. And he thinks maybe even his behavior changed then. I don't know. We had just talked about that recently. I had always tied it back to the rugby injuries. But so he got hooked on heroin and somehow he still made it through college and got his degree and all that. But in the process, he was probably after rehab clean. I don't know, maybe a couple of months, but I don't think he truly dealt with the deep issues that caused his addiction until much later. 
And as a mom's perspective, what was so hard for me is just all the fears this led to. Hmm. And being an addict puts you in touch with a very dark, dangerous side of the world that I had no experience with. To date, since Grant became a heroin addict, he's had 10 friends or acquaintances die. Another one has died. Even you heard me share this before, come here, just within the last couple of months. And at the time, my son was living in another city. And every time I saw on my phone that someone was calling from that city, I mean, my heart would skip a beat. Mm -hmm. I would think, I'm getting the call. Grant's died. Something's happened here. And what happened is all these kids were dying either through ODing or suicide or even murder because of a drug deal that went bad. Wow. And for him to lose, the most recent one was his best friend from college died from complications. It wasn't ODing, but complications from heroin use. And I learned at that point, I'm so grateful. I was open with other Christian women. This could have been really embarrassing, but when you get really desperate, you just don't care. Hmm. And... I was in a meeting of church leaders from all over the world. I mean, some of them I knew pretty well, not so much some of them. There were women from Africa who lead large churches over there that's meeting from the very first time. And someone asked us all, just as an icebreaker, I'm not sure they even expect us to open up this much, but I was feeling desperate. And I was at these meetings. I didn't care what was going on during the meetings. I was just afraid my son was going to die. They had a heroin addiction and he was going to die. And someone asked, so how's everyone doing in their faith? And I thought, well, I'll just tell you. And I tried not to take up all the time or verbally just barf all over the group. But I told him my son had an addiction and I'm just feeling fearful all the time that he's going to die. And a really good friend of mine, we hadn't talked that week, but in her time with God that week, she'd been reading this book, this devotional book. And in the book, she had read about we have to trust that no matter what happens, God will give us the grace we need in that moment. And Mm. that turned my life around. Because this friend and I had even talked before, what we would try to do in the past was you keep praying about something, pray about the worst case scenario ever and pray about that till you're okay with it. Something is this, I know it sounds (laughs) dumb, but when something is this awful, You're just never going to be okay with it until God blesses with you in the moment with the grace you're going to need. I mean, I was never going to be able to work through and get to the point where I was going to be okay with my son dying. Right. I really was. I thought, okay, I'd kind of had this idea. There's a quote by C.S. Lewis, and I don't have it in front of me. I'm probably going to slaughter it, but something along the lines of, we don't worry if fear that God want what's best for us. We just fear how painful that best is going to be. Hmm. And that, that's been my faith issue my entire life. And this was so helpful to realize, okay, quit it. I got to stop thinking, well, what if he dies? What if he can't take care of himself? What if he ends up living under a bridge? Whatever. I had to just quit it and trust God and live in the moment. Because one of my faith issues had always been, well, God didn't promise me that certain things aren't going to happen. He doesn't promise me my son couldn't die. How do I deal with it? And so I'd have all this fear. And I thought, all along, I've been asking the wrong questions. Hmm. That what my focus needs to be is God will get me through it. And I got to keep my eyes on God. And from that point forward, with the idea of Grant dying, it was a miracle from God. I really was able to just turn that off and quit what if it. And I felt like I was having so much more peace. Hmm. But then I started, not too long after this, he came home specifically to get clean. And that actually made it a little easier because at least he was under our roof and I knew where he was and what he was doing most of the time, not all of the time. And we have a great relationship with him. I mean, that's one thing I'm grateful for about all the training I've had about how to be a parent and how to love that I've gotten from the Bible and from being in the church and that he had the relationship with us when he really wanted to change, he came home to do it. But just some of the things he was going through, even though he never fought with us, he was always loving and respectful for the most part. 
but he started exhibiting some really odd behaviors. And I started just really stressing out over weird things. Like my whole career working in ministry, I've done a whole lot of public speaking. I mean, it's like, it's what I do. I was on the inside having a little freak out every time I spoke. And I would talk to my friends about it. And I think most of my friends were so blown away by some of the things I was dealing with at home that they couldn't see past that either. So finally, I thought, I need professional help. And I started seeing a counselor. And she helped me see that if you don't deal with the root of your fears, that they just multiply like bunnies. And when I'm fearful about one thing, it comes out in other areas. And what was happening was, because I had such a low level of stress going on at home, and I didn't catch it, I was starting to what if again in smaller areas. Like one thing I didn't mention earlier, but I have systemic lupus, and it's rare that I'm without symptoms. Usually I just don't feel very good. And I was having to speak at a conference in Seattle, and it was in the evening. Normally I try to speak in the mornings just because I feel better, but I was probably running a low-grade fever, and the room was really cold, and I started to shake uncontrollably while I was speaking. And it went, the lesson ended up going fine, but everyone could tell I was shaking. I had to borrow someone's coat, and it really bothered me. Mm. And the counselor helped me see that's what started it all. I started thinking before I was speaking at something, what if I get up there? I'm too sick to do this. Maybe I'm just getting too old to do this. What if I do that again and start shaking in front of a thousand people and there's not a coat I can borrow? What if I get up there and start shaking so bad I can't even talk? What if I do this? What if I do that? She helped me see I had to overcome that, that I had faulty patterns of thinking Mm -hmm. that it just made me think instead of trusting God, I was just always feeling like I was going to mess up something. And she helped me see where that had started and how I'd started doing that. And so I was really able to have some huge victories in that area. Wow. First of all, thank you for being that transparent. And I appreciate all the things that you've shared thus far. And as you were speaking, I was writing down my questions because there's a couple of things that you stated that I would like to go in more detail with. But I'm looking at the time and we're running out of time. So what I would like to do is have you come back because I want to dig a little bit deeper in your journey, especially with how you worked with your son after he lapsed and what that experience was like, as well as how God continued to hold you during this season. So are you willing to come back and get hammered with some questions? (laughs) Sure, Kimir, I'd love to. Okay, well, I appreciate it. Listeners, please come back next Tuesday to hear Patty share more about her experiences I hope what you've heard so far is no one is exempt from having life experiences. I think that's the reality that as long as we're here, we're going to experience things that are very painful, but we're also going to experience joys. And I really would like to kind of talk through how do we continue to embrace and have joys despite these tough experiences. So please come back listen to us. It will definitely encourage your spirit.